the future if you believe your climate change narrative, which I do, is changing. So we, we need to not just continue as we were, otherwise we'll be running behind. We need to run to stay still. So uh, I thought I'd just quickly go through what are our current challenges. Um, as with a lot of people in rooms, I guess flooding and erosion is one of them. Um, there's some lovely pictures of various issues. Cowley Bridge floods on a regular basis. It has done since it was built in 18 Tumpty Tumpty. And as you can see, we didn't used to do anything. Now we have temporary flood barriers in place. And subsequent to that picture, we've done work to raise some of the critical assets and electronics. And so it doesn't stop the flood happening. But what it does is it reduces the damage it does. It reduces the recovery period. So there's parts, two parts of your resilience loop. Um, <clears throat> that was the bridge scour. That was a lovely example because that wasn't just an extreme event. It wasn't particularly an extreme event. It was an occurrence frequency. So three one in 50 year storms went through within a shorter time space than normal and the bridge was scoured because the bed couldn't recover. So it just demonstrates it's not necessarily the extremity of the event that happens. It may be the extremity of the frequency that happens. Um, and everyone probably remembers that one all over the news. Um, <clears throat> February 2014, there was a storm which made a bit of a mess. While we were repairing, there was another storm which made an even bigger part of a mess. It didn't just affect us. There was a road behind there that disappeared. There was gas and electric pipes in there in that road that disappeared, telecoms. And the poor old houses that you can't see here, one house lost its front porch. So it, it, it's not just about what happens to us. It's, it's what's our part in the whole resilience of the area. Um, Rail access to Southwest was blocked for two months, which is a little unacceptable. Um, um, it cost us £63 million just to put it back together, and that was to put it back as it was. It hasn't actually been improved for climate change at this time. That's another project that's now ongoing, and that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but it also cost £28 million in disruption payments to passengers and train, train companies. And estimates for what it costs society, this is something that we're trying to get to grips with now. Um, we're, we're still struggling in some cases to understand the true cost to network rail, but estimates for what it costs the South West are anything from a million pounds a day to a billion pounds over the whole two months it was shut. That doesn't come off our balance sheet, but as a provider of a national service, it's something that we need to be taking into account. Uh, wind, heavy rain and lightning all grouped together under sort of general storminess. Um, brings down trees on lines. Uh, that, that's, an, that's an entire embankment that's been washed out. That isn't a river passing underneath it. It is now, but it wasn't. Um, you've probably got one of them in your garden, and if you've got kids, you've got one of them in your garden. Uh, please check if you still have. And if you've got one of them, they put great, great big staples in the packet that you're supposed to drive into the ground. Please do, otherwise that happens. And then lightning, obviously that, that strikes electrical equipment and anything metal and tall. Um, that was as a result of, uh, of rain falling on third party land. It wasn't actually land uh, that we owned. It was an overland flow that came down and washed out a, a chalk embankment near Watford. Um, <clears throat> the net result was it blocked the tunnel, a bit of a, bit of a down on a large commuter line. Uh, more importantly, a train was derailed slightly and an oncoming train glancingly struck it. Significant damage to both trains, but with 300 odd people on the trains in total, no serious injuries. Could have been a lot worse. And that was a, an occurrence that was outside of our direct control. So this again shows you that your resilience has to think beyond your boundaries. Hence the flying trampolines as well. Um, temperatures. Top and bottom. Um, everyone's aware of the wrong kind of snow getting into the trains from 20 odd years ago. I remember that as a kid. But snow of any kind can block a line. It can get stuck between points and gets compressed and then they don't work. So you have to get it out of the way. Icicles, um, they look pretty, but if you go into a tunnel, you can have huge blocks of ice hanging from the air shafts, and if they fall onto the line or the train, you've got an issue. Um, last summer, not so much buckles, thankfully, but, but desiccation of embankments, particularly in the southeast, the Fenland areas, it was a long, long, hot, dry summer. It wasn't the most extreme summer we've had, but it was one of the driest and longest in a long time. So you then start to get ride quality issues, which it's not the end of the world if it's a bit bumpy for the passengers, but if it gets too bumpy, you have to put speed restrictions in place as a prevention so that you don't get buckles, you don't get derailing. So you're taking precautionary steps, which if you do it right, end up in no incidents, but end up with lots of delays and unhappy passengers. 
So you've got no, where was the man, but it's justification. You've got no billowing flames and people going, oh, it's all fine, yeah, I understand. So again, you've got to look at what can you do. This is all a combination of operational response, but it's also long-term investment. And that's just talking about today. So that's, that's just what I was talking about there. We, we had, um, <clears throat> overall, we had 40 to 50% increase in asset failure rates due to heat that year. And if you look at the early months in April, June, when you got the harvesting of faults that have accumulated over winter, it was up to 80% higher. Um, our PPM, which is the performance measure, passengers on time, trains on time, dropped by 4.2%, purely just due to the heat speeds and things. Um, it can have long-lasting impacts. So this is, this is all about understanding your current impacts. If you can do climate change, you need to understand your baseline, where you're starting from. So this is our performance of trains on time on what we call a normal weather day. Now we've done a lot of research into what, what failures are caused by what weather and when and how and a lot of definition has gone into what is a normal day, what is an adverse day which is weather that is, is severe enough to impact the assets and the performance but most passengers would think well I've got to the flipping station so why aren't my train here? Um, that's the gap in a way between sort of um, the understanding of the asset performance and public expectation. And then the bottom line is just extreme weather, which is again, people go, yeah, I can't remember the snow. Um, typically, the gap here is about two or three percent. Um, and the challenge to us as an industry is to get rid of that two or three percent. Because if the public expect the service to be there and they can get there on another mode of transport or whatever else, then unless you've got a really good sound engineering or technological reason why it didn't work, you should be getting there. It is a bit of a risk, a bit of a challenge to talk about it that cavalierly because obviously that line represents a range in of itself. The event that caused that severity, that, that severity of impact in the performance may have been marginally off severe. Equally, that one might have been quite close to, to normal. It, so within that, you've got to understand what is the portion that is deliberately and totally accountable for by the weather and what was a weakness in your asset in, inherently and where did the two match up. So you do more analysis, you start to look at what faults occur when. So this is looking at, these are what are called Schedule 8 categories, I don't know if people know, but we have to pay compensation to train operating companies when certain types of failures occur. And uh, that's, that's the categories, wind, substance, that covers everything from, from desiccation to landslip, snow, which includes ice, lightning, heat, fog, flood, coastal and everything, uh, cold, is just cold temperatures in itself, not, not snow and ice. And adhesion, which is anything that makes the track slippy. <laughs> Leaves is the one that everyone quotes all the time, but it can be ice, it can be oil, whatever. And you can start to see when, when did your problems occur. So there was last summer, that was your heat. And there was the beast from the east. Um, because this is divided by financial year, actually both of those occurred in the same calendar year. So you can start to see, you can start to relate it to particular weather events. You can start to do cause attribution and then you can start to understand your location and then you can start to do something about it. We put a lot of work into this. We collect a lot of weather impact data. So what you just saw is Schedule 8. That's coded by location. It's coded by weather type. So we know what event caused the failure at what location. Also within our, our fault management system, it tells you what the fault was so you can attribute it to a particular asset. We've now got 12 years of this data. Um, there's a bit of an issue with long data sets in that they change the, uh, the amount that you pay in Schedule A to, uh, back in about 2010 or so, so there's a step change in cost, but you can account for that in normalisation. You can start to see patterns over 12 years, but only of the high frequency events. 30 years is climate as a minimum, but you, you start to do some work on it. So we've started to look at analysis of failure curves for the assets. So the graph top left is points operating equipment. And as you can see, there's a sweet spot. So that's when you get your normal weather and everything hums along nicely. That's when you get a doubling of failures, which is your, your, your adverse weather. And that's when you get a tripling of failures, which is your extreme weather. So you can start to pick out thresholds within your weather events. Um, the one below is earthworks and it's landslips in response to rainfall. Then you can start to look at your asset classes, overhead line equipment, traction and power, miscellaneous, I like that one, SCADA, telephones, transmission, electricity, and you can start to go, 
what are the numbers that go in these boxes. So anything green on there is in the green zone. It doesn't have a failure trigger, it's all fine. Anything that's got a yellow number there is when you see a doubling, that's your first threshold. Anything with a red number, that's your trebling. You can then start to say, okay, I now know what causes the problem, to what assets, where. I now know at what point it causes the problem. I can now start to make some informed engineering decisions. What are my design standards, etc., etc., etc. What are my mean times to failure? What are my asset lifespans? And then along comes climate change. Now, once you've understood all that, it changes it all. So summer and winter temperatures will rise. So the current trigger points, assuming we maintain the same assets with the same design specs, will remain the same. But the frequency with which they'll be exceeded will change. The amount by which they will exceed, be exceeded will change. And if you've got something like a uh, rail stress in temperatures, it's affected by both low and high temperatures, you've got that problem at both ends. Both frequencies will change. Both extents will change. Total rainfall will stay similar across the year. I mean, I, I used to work for a water company, and the mass balance of rainfall for that water company over the year was a 0% change under all climate change scenarios. But seasonally, it was up to 40% reduction in the summer and up to 40% increase in the winter. So again, you can't just look at one parameter of uh, one point on the parameter. You've got to look at all the points on the curve. Storm frequency and intensity will increase. There are two little graphs I've managed to pick up from the Met Office. So that's the track of um, count of winter storms from the North Atlantic. As you can see, it's slowly trending up, depends on which line you slice it on. And then that's the intensity. So again, it catches you one way or both ways. So it either catches you by a change in the frequency of the event that's causing your problem, or it catches you through a change in the intensity of the event, or it catches you by being more frequent and worse. Or, if you're talking about temperatures in the winter, less frequent and better, if it's cold. Wind and lightning, they'll show increases, but there are no real uh, projections under UKCP09 for those, and UKCP18 currently doesn't really cover them very well either, that's work in progress. Sea level will rise, we all know that. Uh, it's going up across the board around the country. It's going up more in the southeast than it is in the northwest. That's simply because we've not got a huge block of ice sat on Scotland anymore. Um, but overall, it will go up everywhere. Um, so, what does that mean for all the stuff I said on the previous slides? It means the challenges will increase. And without any appropriate response, without any adaptation, without any new resilience, so will the impacts. So that's our future. The future is not bright or orange, it's wet, it's soggy, it's windier, it's worse. Assuming we continue business as usual, assuming we don't take any of this into account. So you have to do all the analysis work that you've done previously, and you have to think, what are my strategic objectives? How can I look at what the role we fit for the future should be, and how does that make me think about climate change? So we basically said, the infrastructure has to be able to withstand the impact of future weather conditions. No-brainer statement number one. We need to have rapid recovery from the impacts of adverse and extreme events. That doesn't change. We have to have that now, we have to have it then. If we get that right, and that's the trick, then we have improved performance and safety during adverse and extreme weather conditions. We hopefully see financial savings. Now that might not necessarily be reductions in current costs. It might just be avoided expense in additional delay costs or additional repairs. But it's all about economic efficiency. And we get enhanced reputation and trust in the railway's ability to manage the weather events. So back to what the man from the airport was saying is, when the customers arrive at the station and there are no trains, they go, oh, yeah, I can see why, rather than the usual, oh my god, it's them again. So to do this, you need governance and accountability. As with everything, you've got to have a structure. So, so basically, um, we need to liaise, region and route in internal engagement. It needs to be a system approach. There needs to be a stakeholder engagement. So, we need to be engaging with highways agency, which we, we do through IOAF, and we do have occasional meetings with them individually as well, and other forums, because mode shift, when our trains aren't running, people jump onto the roads, when there's a problem with the roads, they jump onto the train. Um, we need to share lessons and best practice. That's got to be a systems thing right across the whole thing, but, but internally, we need to integrate climate change into business as usual. It needs to be embedded, it needs to be a non-decision. The design standard has already said, if you're building something that's going to operate in 2050, it will be to this size, and you don't have to think about adding 10%, because if you have to think about adding 10%, you're doing it wrong. 
it becomes seen as an additional cost, it becomes seen as headroom, it becomes seen as something that can be deleted if you're looking to make a cost efficiency. You need action and investment, so once you've got it baked into the embedding, you've got to do stuff. And you've got to have analysis and reporting, plan, do, act, check, learn. And we've got to streamline operational weather management, because whatever we do thinking with the future head on, it's always got to be what's going to keep the way we're running today, tomorrow, how do we respond to it. There's no point doing something now for then that means it doesn't work, work properly now. So what have we done? Well, in, in CP5, which is coming to an end this, this April, I know, it already has anyway, uh, 2019 uh, is, our, is our change of a year. So we developed climate change risk assessment guidance. We didn't have that before. Um, nobody was told how to think about climate change, and it's not... If you break it down into general engineering principles and thinking, it's not difficult, rocket science, but it is actually just thinking about something differently because human beings are no good at risk perception. That's why we have risk assessment grids. That's why I have all these things, is to force us to do it. We don't do it well. Um, so you've got to show people how to do it. So guidance is the first way. That's linked to an environmental and social requirements piece that we put in place in, in this year as well, which is right across the board, everything from sustainability to, to um, ethical timber through to line-side neighbour relationships. It lays down the basic principles you should be thinking about at each stage of delivery of a project. Um, we have agreed a plan to integrate climate change into asset policies and standards. That kicks off in this CP6 we'll come on to. And we're looking at sustainable procurement processes, again, trying to make our suppliers think about it, and how does the investment process work? These are all things that we've started to kick off. Uh, that's backed up by actual investment. So we actually have a RACA, Weather Resilience and Climate Change Adaptation Strategy. That was written in 2017. It will be refreshed to CP6. That lays out the general principles of what we will do and when. So, for example, uh, statements like uh, replace with like for better than like for like. So if the asset has just failed because it only has a temperature tolerance of 40 degrees, don't just put one back at 40 degrees, put one back at 60. We have got root resilience and racker plans for all the routes individually, the eight of them. They wrote them in 2014. They're being updated again, so they go through a process of reassessing their risks every five years. Um, enhanced engagement with government and regulators. We're trying to set up a, a wide forum for the whole of the, the rail industry and we need to improve our, our liaison across the transport industry and um, we're updating our risk register. Um, we carry on with the analysis and reporting, we carry on with the PPM and Schedule 8 collection and analysis, we are doing work to identify assets, sensitivities and thresholds in the future so those numbers I showed you on that lovely colourful diagram earlier We've got a consultant working for us saying, OK, how often do those numbers crop up at time periods in the future, both individually and as, and as sort of, uh, not just frequency, but also duration? How does that change? Um, we're looking at flood risk uh, and adaptation cost. We don't understand the full cost to network rail. We are really rubbish at, at, at capturing the operational cost. Gangs get sucked off one job onto that and over time just gets put into a big pot and then nobody looks at what the impact on the other job they were taken off was, so you don't have a proper picture of it. And we continue work to look at the climate change projections and we're issuing a, a guidance on scenarios, which I'll come on to in a minute, uh, and we will upgrade to 18 in due course. Uh, we're currently reviewing all our operational management uh, modules and so forth for, for weather resilience. Um, Today, talking about climate change doesn't inform today particularly, but it's starting to get strategic thinking in like, we respond in this way, we respond in this way every year, and we have done for every year for the last six decades, but maybe when we get to 2040, autumn is no longer where it was. So autumn planning should start later. And we need to review that in 2040 type of thing. Um, and that's basically what we've done. It's a lot of strategy, a lot of policy, a lot of kicking off research. Uh, there was investment in CP5. CP6 we kick into the doing a bit more. So the climate change projections and frequency guidance will be published by the end of May. It will be a rolling feast. There are blanks in it. It will be upgraded to UKCP18. The EA will change its guidance in due course, but it's out there and it will be used. And it will be used to inform assets that are being created through projects, but it's also supposed to be used to inform uh, activities like maintenance activities. Think about your workforce welfare. Think about your flooding impacts on your access to the site. 
Um, updated assets and policies and standards. That's a piece of work that's kicked off and is starting in earnest now. Each of our asset functions is going to write their own asset risk assessment and plan like the roots have. And once that's done, we can start to go, and what do we do about it? How do we change the standards? We've got pilot projects going on to support GRIP, which is our investment management process with gateways in it. We're trialling our guidance and we're trialling the, um, the, so both the guidance note and the impact assessment guidance with Crossrail 2 and with the project that's called Exner, which is looking at the Dawlish issue. Um, strategic investment, we've got clear robust plans for resilience improvement. So within the asset plans and within the route plans, there will be clear defined actions and activities. Uh, we'll be implementing action plans within CP6 where they're already funded uh, in the business plan. Where they're not, we will be looking to develop the, the, the proposals for CP7 within CP6. We've got a long-term RACA strategy that's been revised. That's the 2017 one that's been reviewed. That will involve discussions with DFT, DEFRA, Transport for London, Highways Agency, and trying to look across the piece at Tox and Fox as well, the train operating and freight operating companies, to make sure it's a rail industry piece. And this will all be hopefully embedded in strategic business plans for CP7. Again, the analysis and reporting continues. You're all in the engineering world or the climate change world or whatever, so you know that it never stops. Once you've got the answer to one problem, all it does is open up the next can of worms or two or three. Um, or, 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 OK, so we've got the answer, we've got the number, but how the heck do we use it? Um, so we'll be doing more work on the vulnerability, so that's more understanding of the threshold, more understanding of, of the risks. We'll be trying to look at better ways of prioritising so it becomes an investment-based decision rather than an add-on. Um, we need to better understand our interdependencies, both within network rail, because there is silo mentality, but, but particularly across the wide UK. So like I said, the relationship between the, 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 the train operating and freight operating companies and us on weather resilience and climate change is not as good as it could be. Um, we have a relationship with Highways England, but again, is it as good as it could be? Do we need to have a better relationship with... The, the DNOs and National Grid. We need to develop resilience metrics because we're rushing on with all this guidance, we're rushing into all these decisions, all these investment plans, but we haven't actually really come up with a smart way of measuring it yet. I'll give you one example. Uh, someone suggested that we look at the number of assets that we have at risk of flooding. And obviously investment will reduce that level of assets at risk of flooding, and therefore that's a good indicator of flood risk. To which the answer is, no it's not. Because any one given asset we may look at the risk of the flood. We may decide that the best business decision to make is to allow that asset to flood and recover it rather than prevent it. So that asset then stays on the list as an asset at risk of flooding, even though we've dealt with the risk. So it's not as simple as it looks. And how do you come up with one or two headline metrics for network rail, which covers the whole of the United Kingdom and employs 50 odd thousand people and has millions of assets, each with its own bespoke problems? <coughs> We think we're getting there, but I'm not going to say anything because it could fall apart on me. Um, we'll obviously report to DEFRA. Uh, I know it's a voluntary report, but we've done it the last couple of times and we will continue to do it because we see the value in getting our house in order. And also it's about the reputation communication. It's about the, the having a buy-in from your stakeholders that you are doing <coughs> the right thing. And we'll continue to, to streamline operation weather management. Uh, at the moment, the National F uh, Framework F uh, F Adhesion Working Group exists, but it only looks at autumn. Why doesn't the Adhesion Working Group look at the whole year? We're having those sort of conversations. Uh, we need to audit seasonal preparedness because we, we know we're doing the right things in the right places, but somehow performance doesn't always improve. It's getting better, but is it that the seasons have changed on us or that what has been right for decades now isn't because the, the trains have changed or, or customer perception has changed, so the performance level you're performing to is no longer as good as it should be? Um, We've identified collaboration operations with the operational weather management team and business plans need to be placed for the more critical assets for CP7.